Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Chrome Yellow, a novel by Aldous Huxley. So I believe this is one of his earlier works. Uh, as with his last one of these penguins, there's a super long the blurb that con continues on the rear inside page. So I'm going to go through that, then I'm going to check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... This was the book with which Huxley made his debut as a novelist. Spontaneous, light-hearted yet serious, it was immediately felt to be symptomatic yet in advance of the generation which produced it. Although based on the Peacockian foundation of a country house party and essentially a novel full of witty and clever conversation, it is not without some of the funniest incidents in any of Mr Huxley's works. For instance, the fake Madame Siostris telling fortunes at Crown Fair. The characters include a poet, a painter, a spiritual journalist, one of Mr Huxley's most severe portraits, a girl who is really deaf, and one who is merely deaf to the amorous advances made to her, while in contrast the other young female guest at Chrome is only too open to them. Amongst the most delightful features of the book are the discursive arguments of Mr Scrogan, the chapters from Henry Wimbush's History of Chrome, and the engaging snippets of quoted verse which fall so naturally into the sequence of the story. So yeah, this was, was what he made his debut as a novelist with, but actually Antic Hay was his first novel. So I don't know how that works. And my sticky tab has just ripped the page. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. So we get a character called Mr. Barbecue Smith, which is a great name. And a great little excerpt here on books, which I'm sure you'll enjoy as a bookish person yourself, presumably, otherwise why are you watching this video? He did not sit down, but walked backwards and forwards in front of the bench, gesticulating a little as he talked. Books, he said, books. One reads so many and one sees so few people and so little of the world. Great thick books about the universe and the mind and ethics. You've no idea how many there are. I must have read 20 or 30 tons of them in the last five years. 20 tons of ratiocination. Weighed with that, one's pushed out into the world. Who measures how many books they've read by the weight of them? And um, we get this little bit about uh, a pig. Uh, so we get... The sow next door, Mr. Wimbush went on, has done very badly. She only had five in her litter. I shall give her another chance. If she does no better next time, I shall fat her up and kill her. There's the boar, he pointed towards a father's sty. Fine old beast, isn't he? But he's getting past his prime. He'll have to go too. How cruel, Anne exclaimed. But how practical, how eminently realistic, said Mr. Scogan. In this farm we have a model of sound paternal government. Make them breed, make them work, and when they're past working or breeding or begetting, slaughter them. Farming seems to be mostly indecency and cruelty, said Anne. Oh yeah, it kind of is. As is government. And we get this little excerpt here, two writers talking to each other. You write, he asked, don't you? Well, yes, a little, you know. How many words do you find you can write in an hour? I don't think I've ever counted. Oh, you ought to, you ought to, it's most important. Dennis exercised his memory. When I'm in good form, he said, I fancy I'd do a 1200 word review in about four hours, but sometimes it takes me much longer. Mr. Barbecue Smith nodded. Yes, 300 words an hour at your best. He walked out into the middle of the room, turned round on his heels and confronted Dennis again. Guess how many words I wrote this evening between five and half past seven? I can't imagine. No, but you must guess, between five and half past seven, that's two and a half hours. 1,200 words, Dennis hazarded. No, 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 Mr. Barbecue Smith's expanded face shone with gaiety. Try again. 1,500. No. I give it up, said Dennis. He found he couldn't summon up much interest in Mr. Barbecue Smith's writing. Well, I'll tell you. 3,800. Dennis opened his eyes. You must get a lot done in a day, he said. So I do about 800 words an hour, so I would have done about 2,000 words in that time. Great little line here. She was accustomed in London to associate only with first-rate people who liked first-rate things, and she knew that there were very, very few first-rate things in the world, and that those were mostly French. And then we get a little rant here about God. Uh, I find with most of Huxley's stuff, it's actually like the viewpoints that his characters express and the, like the philosoph philosoph philosophizing and stuff that makes them worth reading, and this is very much true here. That morning he had preached, as he had often preached before, on the nature of God. He had tried to make them understand about God, what a fearful thing it is to fall into his hands. God, they thought of something soft and merciful. They blinded themselves to facts, still more, they blinded themselves to the Bible. The passengers on the Titanic sang, Nearer my God to thee, as the ship was going down. Did they realise what they were asking to be brought nearer to? A white fire of righteousness, an angry fire. I like the fact as well that it mentions Nero, my God, to thee. That's one of my fun facts that I know that was what the band was playing as they went down. We get a reference to some people clattering through Uxbridge, Slough, Maidenhead and Sleeping Reading. All of those are very, very close to where I live, so that was interesting. Used to go to an open mic in Maidenhead. 
And we get this, which I've tried, it doesn't work. <laughs> Priscilla turned her head in his direction. The monumental coiffure nodded exorbitantly at her slightest movement. You must make an effort, she said. When I can't sleep, I concentrate my will. I say, I will sleep, I am asleep, and pop, off I go. That's the power of thought. But does it work on stuffy nights, Ivor inquired. I simply cannot sleep on a stuffy night. Nor can I, said Mary, except out of doors. I just can't sleep at all on any night. And I thought this was an interesting passage, not least because it contains some French, and obviously I am learning French, or I am attempting to. There's a lot of French in this, actually. And also a little bit of German here and there, and one thing I've noticed Huxley does is he'll use French, German, and Spanish, and then not actually provide the translations. So if you don't speak the languages, you're not going to have any clue what he's going on about, but hey-ho. That's the test for the literary mind, said Dennis. The feeling of magic, the sense that words have power. The technical verbal part of literature is simply a development of magic. Words are man's first and most grandiose invention. With language, he created a whole new universe. What wonder if you loved words and attributed power to them. With fitted, harmonious words, the magicians summoned rabbits out of empty hats and spirits from the elements. Their descendants, the literary men, still go on with the process, mortising their verbal formulas together and, before the power of the finished spell, trembling with delight and awe. Rabbits out of empty hats know their spells are more subtly powerful, for they evoke emotions out of empty minds. Formulated by their art, the most insipid statements become enormously significant. For example, I proffer the constatation, black ladders lack bladders, a self-evident truth one on which it would not have been worthwhile to insist had I chosen to formulate it in such words as black fire escapes have no bladders or les échelles noires manque de vessie. But since I put it as I do, black ladders lack bladders, it becomes, for all its self-evident, significant, unforgettable, moving. The creation by word power of something out of nothing. What is that but magic? Anna may add, what is that but literature? Half the world's greatest poetry is simply les échelles noires manque de vessie, translated into magic significance as black ladders lack bladders and you can't appreciate words. I'm sorry for you. And a little, great little conversation between a dude and a woman here. For the simple reason, Gombal mimicked her voice, that you want me to make love to you and, when I do, to have the amusement of running away. Anne threw back her head and laughed. So you think it amuses me to have to evade your advances, so like a man. And we get this. But I don't want power, said Dennis. He was sitting in limp discomfort at one end of the bench, shading his eyes from the intolerable light. Mr. Scogan, bolt upright at the other end, laughed again. Everybody wants power, he said. Power in some form or other. The sort of power you hanker for is literary power. Some people want power to persecute other human beings. You expend your lust for power in persecuting words, twisting them, moulding them, torturing them to obey you. I want literary power. And we get this little uh, soliloquy by Mr. Scogan, he says, I'm sorry, said Mr. Scogan. I, for one, without ever having had the slightest appreciation of painting, have always taken particularly pleasure in cubismus. I like to see pictures from which nature has been completely banished, pictures which are exclusively the product of the human mind. They give me the same pleasure as I derive from a good piece of reasoning, or a mathematical problem, or an achievement of engineering. Nature, or anything that reminds me of nature, disturbs me. It is too large, too complicated, above all too utterly pointless and incomprehensible. I am at home with the works of man. If I choose to set my mind to it, I can understand anything that any man has made or thought. That is why I always travel by tube, never by bus if I can possibly help it, for, travelling by bus, one can't avoid seeing, even in London, a few stray works of God. The sky, for example, an occasional tree, the flowers in the window boxes. But travel by tube and you see nothing but the works of man. Iron riveted into geometrical forms, straight lines of concrete, patterned expanses of tiles. All is human and the product of friendly and comprehensible minds. All philosophies and all religions, what are they but spiritual tubes bored through the universe? Through these narrow tunnels where all is recognisably human, one travels comfortable and secure, contriving to forget that all round and below and above them stretches the blind mass of earth, endless and unexplored. Yes, give me the tube and cubismus every time. Give me ideas so snug and neat and simple and well made. And preserve me from nature. Preserve me from all that's inhumanly large and complicated and obscure. I haven't the courage, and above all, I haven't the time to start wondering in that labyrinth. And uh, one final thing I want to read out here. Human contacts have been so highly valued in the past only because reading was not a common accomplishment and because books were scarce and difficult to reproduce. The world, you must remember, is only just becoming literate. As reading becomes more and more habitual and widespread, an ever-increasing number of people will discover that books will give them all the pleasures of social life and none of its intolerable tedium. At present, people in search of pleasure naturally tend to congregate in large herds and to make a noise. In future, their natural tendency will be to seek solitude and quiet. The proper study of mankind is books. Amen to that. So yeah, Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Uh, I've kind of, 
I kind of read this and thought it reminded me of a cross between like John Steinbeck and Agatha Christie, but without the murder mystery, but still with those like strong human elements and these uh, strong studies of character. The characters in this were fantastic. The plot kind of played second fiddle, although there was some really good stuff with this village fair. Um, and so, yeah, overall though, it was just like um, quite philosophical, quite funny at times, quite savage at times, and overall a good read, so I gave it a four out of five. <laughs> So there we have it, that's what I made of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.